Well, hi there. The Dictionary of Common Uses defines the word tarantula to mean a big hairy spider. And the words Goliath bird eater as the biggest hairy spider of all the hairy spiders and a big hairy spider that eats birds. Now, not all of this is true, but tarantulas are generally big and hairy. And the Goliath bird eater, no matter which species you might be referring to, is among the largest. In our video about the Chilean rosehair tarantula, we actually get into some of the things that make tarantulas unique from other large hairy spiders, like the hogna wolf spider that we covered before, or the huntsman spider. Should we cover those in the future? And those are all big, impressive spiders. The Goliath bird eater could totally kill and eat any of those. Technically, it could, and probably does on occasion, kill and eat a bird, but that isn't really a common part of their diet. These are huge spiders. And really, being huge is what defines a Goliath bird eater. This is actually a common name for a number of giant tarantulas. And today, we have Dr. Joey Muggleston here with us, the owner of Great Basin Serpentarium, one of the most successful tarantula breeders in the United States, to talk about the differences between these most massive of all spiders. But before we get to that, I think we need to figure out if the Goliath bird eater is a good pet. And if it is the best pet tarantula for you, and in order to do this, we're going to need to score the Goliath bird eater based on our five categories, which are handleability, care, hardiness, availability, and upfront costs. All of the Goliath bird eaters, no matter which species we're talking about, are in the genus Therophosa. And their care and size are all very, very similar. So I'm not going to distinguish between them in this particular video. For handleability, we give the Goliath bird eater a score of 2 out of 5. The reality is you can potentially handle this spider and not have any problems. The Goliath bird eater isn't going to put you in any real danger. That said, it can hurt you. The venom, barring some sort of crazy allergic reaction, is no big deal. But those fangs will be no picnic at all. They also can, and notoriously do, kick irritating hairs. This is fairly common for New World tarantulas, and especially for these guys. These can cause severe itching and really hurt you if you get them in the eyes or if any are inhaled. They will generally give some warnings if they're irritated. Many tarantulas will bring their rear legs onto the abdomen a moment before they start kicking, giving you a moment to stop doing whatever it is that you're doing that they don't like. They may also rear up. These guys may stridulate their pedipalps and make a sound. This, again, this isn't an animal that is going to kill you, but you probably want to avoid its defenses anyway. As I said in our video about Gila monsters, I won't die if I get my foot run over by a truck, but I still try to avoid it. But the real reason that I wouldn't recommend handling them is because of how dangerous it is for the spider. This isn't the calmest of spiders, but it is the heaviest of spiders. You know the expression, the bigger they are, the harder they fall? Well, we asked Sir Isaac Newton. Fact check, true. Tarantulas are notoriously fragile. Arboreal tarantulas are less likely to fall and tend to have lightly built bodies. This is not an arboreal spider. They can climb, but generally they spend their time on the ground down in a burrow. And again, it is the heaviest spider in the world. A nervous terrestrial massive tarantula is a recipe for a dead spider if you make handling a common practice. If you want a spider that's good for handling, I would recommend getting a jumping spider. Plus, they're just awesome. When it comes to care, we give the Goliath bird eater a score of 4 out of 5. New World tarantulas generally are easy to keep, though desert dwelling smaller tarantulas are probably the easiest. This is a rainforest dwelling giant tarantula. This just means that the enclosure needs to be larger, humidity and temperatures a bit higher, and more food. Let's start with what you need to feed a bird eater. You could probably overpower and kill a honey badger with your bare hands. I might not bet on you to win the first badger fight, but I think if you had a bunch of lives like Mario, every now and then you'd be able to pull it off. That said, if I made you do this on a regular basis, I would predict that you would live a short and painful life. And this is why a diet consisting of live birds or rodents is not a good idea for your bird eater, badger eater. What is possible and what is sustainable are often different things. Live birds and live rodents are dangerous prey. 
honestly avoid feeding them to anything that will eat about anything else. What do make good feeders are insects like crickets and roaches, as well as other appropriately sized invertebrates. Dubia roaches are probably the best thing they could ever eat, and they get big, so they even make good feeders for adult bird eaters. How much less popular, though, do you think this spider would be if it were called roach eater instead of bird eater? Like most tarantulas, they don't eat a ton of insects, but insects will comprise the bulk of their diet. Given that the spider can grow to have at least an 11 inch leg span, the enclosure for an adult is considerably bigger than for smaller tarantulas. Make sure it has a very secure lid. These are big and strong, and escape frequently leads to falls. Though the tarantula and home alone seem to do okay. That enclosure should favor ground space and not even give the opportunity for the spider to get up very high if possible to prevent falls. Do provide several inches of substrate that will hold the burrow and humidity. Also provide hides, a water bowl, and likely heat. While I would recommend a heat pad on a thermostat to add the heat, I want to be extremely clear about how to avoid killing your spider with it. Do not put the heat pad on the bottom of the enclosure. These spiders burrow to escape the heat. They won't figure out that they live in a bizarro world where heat comes from underground. They can end up cooked if you put them in this situation. Just for the record, this enclosure is not at all a suitable enclosure for a bird eating spider unless you're just trying to display the spider for the duration of a video. Even still, we're a little worried about it popping out of the top here. I'd like to take just a moment to say thank you to our patrons at Patreon who have made so many things possible for this channel. And I'd like to just invite you to check out our Patreon page to see some of the really awesome things that we try to do for you guys to pay you back for all that you do for us. When it comes to hardiness, we give the Goliath Bird Eater a score of four out of five. This is a pretty hardy spider if you leave it in the enclosure and you don't put the heat pad on the bottom. If not, it is very fragile and easily cooked. In fact, they are cooked and eaten in their native range, so maybe you could try that if you just love heat patterns on the bottom. Be careful about humidity and hydration, especially around molts. That is the most dangerous time for any spider. Make sure it can't be crushed by cage furnishings, even if the spider digs under them, and then you should be good to go. When it comes to availability, we give the Goliath Bird Eater a score of three out of five. They're definitely out there, they can be found occasionally in pet stores and expos, but online from a breeder is probably your best bet. Make sure to get a captive bred spider. Most of the big ones you see for sale are wild caught. This means that you're likely to get a spider that is less healthy and you'll be placing the wild population in jeopardy. This is just unnecessary given that there are great breeders out there that work with them. The spiders of today's video come to us from Great Basin Serpentarium. Basically any kind of tarantula you might want, Great Basin probably produces them captive bred. We'll have a link to their website in the description because you're definitely going to want to check them out. When it comes to upfront costs, we give the Goliath Bird Eater a score of 4 out of 5. A captive bred spiderling is not the cheapest tarantula, but totally affordable if you have to have the biggest tarantula. You're probably going to need a few enclosures as your spider grows, but none are very expensive. You're going to need water bowls, substrate, hides, Unless you keep your home pretty warm, a heat pad and thermostat, a small dubia colony would be nice, but not necessary, and then you're done. And this is why overall we give the Goliath Bird Eater a score of 3.4 out of 5. The Goliath Bird Eater is not the best pet tarantula, but if you have to have the most massive spider in the world, it's still pretty dang reasonable. Now, as promised, I want to turn over some time to Dr. Joey Muggleston to talk to us about all of the Goliath bird eaters that you're likely to see in the pet trade. We are going to quickly go over the three different common spiders that are sold as Goliath bird eaters. So if you go to an expo, you go to a pet store, you'll often see something labeled as Goliath bird eater. And you'll take a picture of it, post it up on Facebook, say, check out my new Goliath bird eater. And then you'll have a whole army of people yelling at you, telling you that that's not what you think it is. So clear up a couple things there. There are three species that are typically sold under the name of Goliath bird eater. You have Theraphosa blondi, which is your classic Goliath bird eater. You have Theraphosa apophysis, which is your pink foot Goliath bird eater. And then you have Theraphosa stearmi, which is your burgundy Goliath bird eater. And so if you entered the hobby after about 2002 and you saw a Goliath bird eater for sale, chances are you were looking at a burgundy Goliath bird eater, the Theraphosa stearmi. 
Um, Stearmy, Apophysis, and Blondi, they're all in the same genus, they're Fosa. They all look very similar until you see enough of them, it kind of becomes a bit easier to tell them apart. Again, more often than not, when you see one for sale, it's Therifosa Stearmy, but now you'll be able to see exactly how to tell them apart and quickly identify Blonde from T. Stearmy or T. Apophysis. Uh, first thing to do is look at the back end. And so, but on the very posterior portion of the opisostoma, so that big old back swollen part of the body, there's a little black spot all right around there. You see it on Therifosa Apophysis. You also see that black spot on Therifosa Stearmy. And so if you see that darkened spot on the back end, there's the hairs under that color. So if they kick all the hairs off, you won't be able to see that. So you have to see them with hairs on there. The fresh imports likely won't have that. Um, but if you see that black spot, you know you are not dealing with a Goliath bird eater. You either have Therifosa Stearmy, the Burgundy Goliath, or Therifosa Apophysis, the Pinkfoot Goliath. Another thing that you'll see often is uh, if you look at the adult spiders, if you look at the legs, the first segment on the leg is called the femur. And on that femur, if it says Therifosa Stearmy, or Therifosa blondi, the femur starts um, more narrow and it widens toward the knee. And so it kind of has this trumpeting look to it as it gets wider toward the knee. Therifosa apophysis won't have that. So on the adults, that's kind of the thing to look for. If it has a black spot, you know it's not Therifosa blondi. If its legs get thicker toward the knee, you know you're not looking at uh, Therifosa apophysis. And another thing that sets blondi apart, and I don't have a big blondi with me right now, but the, the knees themselves, blondies, have hairy knees, whereas Apophysis and Stearmy just have a few hairs on each of their knees. So that's the adults. Look for the black spot on the back end, look for the widening femur, and look for a hair on the knees. And that's an easy way to tell the three apart. There's some other minor differences with color, but that's gonna vary based on molt cycle, sex, and also age. There's also some variation in the shape of the prosoma, but it's a lot easier to just look for that black spot, look at the knees, and look at the femur. As for babies though, a lot of times you'll see babies for sale. I guess easy thing to look at, if it's a bald spider that's been recently imported, you're looking at steer meat. Apophysis and Blondi aren't imported anymore. So if you're seeing it for 70 to 150 bucks on a pet store's table at an expo, you're looking at Therifosa steer meat more often than not. Um, if you're looking at babies, sometimes they'll have babies and you'll see little pink feet on them and they'll say it's a pink foot Goliath and it will have a pink foot Goliath price tag, often 250 plus dollars. Um, Look at the feet. If only four of the feet are pink, that's a baby stearmy. So baby Therifosa stearmy have four pink feet. Therifosa apophysis, apophysis has eight pink feet. And Therifosa blondi doesn't have pink feet at all. So kind of confusing. There's a whole lot of overlap there. But when you're looking at babies, if only the front four legs, so legs one and two have pink feet, you're looking at Therifosa stearmy, the commonly imported one. If all four of them have pink feet, you're looking at Therifosa apophysis. Yeah, that kind of covers the, the basics of it. More often than not, you're looking at this spider, Therifosa stearmy, the burgundy goliath. It's going to be harder to find Apophysis or Blondi unless you're talking to someone that imported them from Europe or occasionally they are captive bred in the States. Thank you so much, Joey. And thank you guys for being here today. As always, like and subscribe. Don't fight honey badgers or cook your spiders. And we hope to see you real soon. And I was like, she keeps moving around and the two butt fingers keep moving up and down. What's going on? <laughs> It's like, fingers? <laughs> like, that's where, that's where, okay? I mean, I can see how they got there. Yep, no, it, 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 now that I've seen it, I can't unsee well, it. I know, their butt fingers are around out. Like, the spinnerets, no, 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 sir. Those are butt fingers. Yes. <laughs> I bet you could. I can. If you don't have spinnerets, it's not worth it. Uh, they're called butt fingers. Joey. <laughs> <laughs> I heard both of you stop breathing right when that happened. <laughs> <laughs> that scared me.